a little talk on a, from a kind of product manager's perspective as to um, why, as a business, we chose to develop websites in Drupal. Although you could pretty much apply this to kind of um, any similar framework like WordPress or Joomla or Google or Rails or Symfony or, or whatever. So my um, company, Miggle, does a, does a couple of things. We do a lot of uh, content creation and content management, um, social media engagement. But we also do quite a lot of web development, and it's the web development part that I'm going to talk about about this evening. So I started about six years ago. And when I started, I said, I'm not going to build a CMS. And I said that for, um, based on this kind of thinking, obviously, then without the benefit of kind of hindsight. But my kind of premise was that the world didn't need another CMS. It just needed the ones that were there to get better than what they were. Um, established CMSs were more likely to be able to embrace new technologies it happens and then should work seamlessly with existing technology, or at least that's the theory. Um, building a CMS from scratch means reinventing wheels, so Kate, you mentioned that in your presentation, you know, there's absolutely no point no. reinventing wheels. Um, new CMSs have greater exposure to bugs and or cover limited use cases, so if you build something from scratch, potentially, you know, the more open to kind of bugs, it's not going to be able to do everything that maybe you kind of need it to do. And uh, it should be easy to find people who can use well-known CMSs. So if you're out there looking for kind of skills, if you're advertising around, you know, people who know WordPress or people who know Joomla, you know, it should be easy to be able to find those people to, uh, to work on it. And I think probably the benefit of hindsight bit here is that when I think about that top point, like the world didn't think about the CMS, it just needed the ones that were there to get better. Actually, looking back to kind of 2007, when you look at a lot of the uh, CMSs that were available, particularly ones that you could kind of buy as products off the shelf, actually a lot of them really didn't get any better at all. And when I look at a lot of our clients now who are kind of stuck on kind of CMSs that they built or that they bought maybe between you know 2000 and 2005, you know they're really stuck with like some really you know. The, Result of some really poor purchasing decisions because those CMSs actually haven't improved. You know, they never actually embraced an existing technology. And they never got any better um, with you know, being able to catch up with new technology. And I think, actually, in hindsight, one of the key reasons for that was is that you buy something off the shelf has very limited <coughs> opportunity to get the um, benefit of kind of community engagement, which is one of the key things I think you get through an open source approach. So. Deciding not to build a CMS, I started looking at Joomla. And the pro of Joomla was it had a really great manual. Printed it all off, read it cover to cover. And uh, the fact it was a great manual exposed what I saw as Joomla's kind of great weakness at the time. But it was actually kind of far too much. So I had all these kind of fantastic kind of product features that I could do all these wonderful things with. But actually at the same time, it wasn't really enough for what I needed it to do. And at the time, the thing that I needed it to do was be able to have a kind of sitemap structure that would allow me to go deeper than three or four levels. And it just wasn't possible to do that with Joomla in 2007. So, I got a CMS. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that was quite good because um, prior to starting up, I, mean, well, I worked at Yahoo for seven years. And actually, in that seven years, I've just forgotten a lot about what the internet was really about because. The longer I stayed there, the more my kind of days got filled up with just arguing about resources and budgets. And actually, at the end of the day, we could have been making cheese sandwiches um, rather than kind of internet sites that didn't really kind of impact on what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it reminded me of how to code. Like a long time ago, I used to be a PHP developer, and after having a break from that for about six or seven years, I started to kind of remember how to kind of put things together again in code. And um, and as a result, learned a lot about my kind of limitations as a coder. Uh, you know, that kind of played on to me thinking then about, you know, I'm going to build a CMS, what are the must-haves, you know, what are the nice-to-haves, you know, what does my kind of product development roadmap look like? So these are all really useful things to learn. One of the problems was, is that I just love coding too much, and I coded to the extent that I actually just forgot about running the rest of my business, to the extent that some days I just didn't even get dressed 
In the end, I decided to kind of bring a developer in to kind of help out with that because I've really reached the limit of my own ability in terms of coding. And, and actually, the developer that I brought in, he wasn't really interested in using anything that had been done before. He wanted to reinvent all the wheels himself, which kind of worked quite well at the time because we had a client who wanted a proprietary solution, so they funded all of the development. And we built this CMS. And we actually realized that the CMS was great for small business websites, which had really simple content management needs. And pretty quickly we built up about 25 plus sites for a number of small businesses. And I think romantically, I'd always wanted to build a small business that actually provided a service for other small businesses. But actually I just found that it was impossible to kind of build a company that serviced small businesses. And um, I think the reason why, and this isn't a criticism of small businesses, because I run a small business and I can actually level a lot of these things against myself. There's always a risk um, that you're going to get undercut with price because price is probably the key criteria for a lot of small businesses. And it's <coughs> easily done because a lot of small businesses are not always best positioned to judge the quality in your profession. So for example, if I wanted a chair to like kind of help me with my bad back, there might be somebody who could build me a bespoke chair that might, that might cost me 2,000 quid, but I'd probably just as easily satisfy myself and go and buy my Paragas for £99.99 and actually have no idea or recognition as to whether one was better than the other. Um, and in reality, you know, you give small businesses a kind of content management system that, you know, they're busy running their business day to day, they don't really spend a lot of time dipping in and out of their website anyway, so they rarely manage their content, and if they do, they just set their line of content <laughs> exercise. And also, I think with a lot of small businesses, they rarely upgrade their sites or buy other services. So, you know, you will end up getting beaten down on cost, build this site that has all this functionality that never gets used, and then they never come back to you for any other repeat businesses. And um, I think, like, you build your own CMS or build something from scratch. It's like building sandcastles. It's a lot of fun. But it's really, really difficult to maintain. And in the end, you just kind of get washed away by the tide of like future future developments. So about two years later, two and a half years later, I said this lunacy has to stop. And uh, yeah, because actually, I think we looked at this and thought, you know, we sell our client self-sufficiency. They don't want to be dependent on us. They buy a solution from us. They don't actually want to be dependent on us. But actually, more importantly, I don't want them to be dependent on me either. You know, if I'm going to build a business that grows, at some point there may be some legacy business that I have that I want to be able to kind of wrap up, kind of take somewhere else. And if I'm too locked into that from a solution perspective, then actually that's really no good for me being able to grow my business. So in 2009, we decided we'd only focus on open source solutions. And actually as part of that decision, we decided to make our own CMS available as an open source project. The way that we saw it, that our work was done, that somebody else might want to take on that code and build it further. Um, it meant that our clients were no longer dependent on us for that code base. You know, they could always take the code elsewhere themselves. And pretty soon after we made that decision, a, a great thing happened. <laughs> um, one of our clients, kind of unbeknownst to us, hired a uh, penetration company to do a security audit at CMS. And they found a small security vulnerability in the way that um, users log in, uh, which wasn't particularly serious and wasn't particularly likely to be exploited. But of course, what our client heard was security vulnerability. And that obviously meant that all of a sudden we had to kind of react and deal with that, actually with a code base that we no really, no really longer cared about. So why was that a great thing? Well, I think it was a great thing because when something like that happens within your business and you get thrown a problem, it's actually how you deal with it that actually kind of makes a difference. So we dealt with it with a big smile on our face. And we felt like this. Actually, I wrote this presentation about six months ago. I can't remember what that <laughs> means. But I think it means like pissed off and really quite annoyed and not wanting to actually do the work. But uh, it obviously had only been discovered because we made the new CMS open source. And my development team are a great team, but they're fairly few in number. And I reckon it's hard, I'd almost say it's impossible for a small team to code a fully secure solution on their own. You've only got two or three developers working on something, 
I mean, there's a limit to which you can expect them to actually be able to code something that's completely robust, that's unhackable by any other developer across the world. And so it kind of validated our approach of um, making that CMS open source. And in the end, no one got hacked anyway, so it was, uh, it was fine. So for me, I think open source and community are great. This um, bit of text here is just something that's kind of taken out of um, one of our standard proposal documents. It talks about our preference being to kind of build solutions that are based on free open source software written in PHP. Um, you know, to us, free is about freedom as much as it is to do about cost. That's to me what free open source really means. It's, it's about freedom. And it allows clients to be free of tie-ins and, and thus I feel more protected from a business continuity perspective. And um, because popular open source solutions are contributed to by thousands of developers, you know, they actually kind of grow and extend and become more usable more quickly. Plus all these other benefits, you know, wheels don't need to be reinvented, clients have limited exposure to bugs, they'll quickly embrace the best of new technology, they'll work seamlessly with existing technology. And also you have staffing advantages, you know, if you've got a good open source solution, you need to go out and find a WordPress developer or a Jira developer. You know, you're looking for someone who actually already understands how to use a framework, rather than trying to get maybe in a PHP coder, whose first challenge is to actually try and decipher what your last PHP coder put together because their solution was poorly documented or written in the wrong way. And for Drupal, we well, put the name of your favourite open source CMS framework in there. For me, it's great because Drupal is, um, you know, it's now on version seven. It powers almost two percent of the of the of the web. Um, it's as much a framework as it is a content management system, which means it can kind of be extended kind of fairly easy. A lot of the modules are kind of very easily reusable. Um, and for me, Drupal's a Lego kit in which we can build trucks and helicopters. Okay, whereas other CMSs, I think, might be more like a truck or a helicopter, and one doesn't easily change into another. So. When I think about Drupal as a Lego kit, I actually think about WordPress as being a toy helicopter. And I think WordPress is great at being a helicopter. And you try and change it into a truck, you can. You can build by all these other kind of plugins that will actually kind of extend its kind of capability. But ultimately, it was designed to be a helicopter. It was never built to be a, to be a Lego kit. And because it's a Lego kit, it's got a lean and efficient core. And then you get flexibility by reusing um, modules all of which are kind of managed under open source license, which is slightly different to some of the other open source uh, projects like WordPress, maybe have kind of other functionality that you have to buy. Clients only need to run the code they need, so it's less cumbersome mm -hmm. than many of its competitors, and also it has a very visible developer community. But why is this great for me as a business owner and a product manager? Does anybody know who the, the dude with the mine is? No, it's the Bowery. And Rivaldi, like, obviously we all know him as a composer, but his day job, um, how he kind of made his money was he was a music teacher. And uh, he uh, taught at, a, um, at an orphanage for, for, for girls. And um, every now and again, he had to get the girls to kind of do performances for the patron of the, of the orphanage. So he'd have to kind of write music for them, and music that was kind of easy enough for them to kind of play, um, you know, so they didn't kind of extend their capabilities. And uh, one bit of music that, uh, that came out of that whole um, period was uh, Four Seasons. So the Four Seasons a bit of music that has kind of stood the test of time. It was ultimately written to be played by a bunch of people who had fairly kind of limited um, musical skills, other than the exception of the first violin, so the, the, bit, the Nigel Kennedy bits. That would have been the Maori playing those on top of the girls playing the second violin and the cellos and the, and the violas. And for me, that's what I quite like about um, using something like Drupal, because I'm thinking about a product, and I'm thinking about a product that is good for doing certain things, and maybe not so good for doing other things. So for me, it's kind of like selling like cans of baked beans rather than selling something completely bespoke. And that's really important for me, because ultimately I run a service business. But for me, to make my service business more effective, I have to try and think about how I can productize those services. If I can productize a service business, then I find that it's easier to kind of get qualified leads. The market kind of helps set the price, and that kind of price is more transparent. So if someone comes to us for Drupal development, we can tell them what the day rate is. But they like the day rate, it's fairly easy for them to go and look at where else they can actually get that resource or buy in um, extra staff from. It's 
it's pretty easy to kind of find out what a Drupal developer costs. So um, you know the market helps set that price. That makes it easier for us in terms of pricing projects. That makes it easier to quote on and propose against briefs on, partly because we can actually look at the briefs that come in. It's easier then to do a gap analysis between what's a required and what's achievable. So you know the brief says we need this product to do this, and you know the Drupal or your framework won't do that. Then it's really easy to say actually this isn't suitable, so the project's not suitable for us. Or we can achieve a workaround and do it. You know rather than doing it this way, the objective that you're trying to achieve is this. So maybe we can achieve that by doing something slightly different. It makes it easy to trade off between the nice to haves and the must to haves. And that's pretty important when you're then trying to kind of uh, you know fit a project into uh, a certain time or, um, or, uh, or or budget constraint. And also we get repeat learnings. You know every time we quote on a project using a, a certain framework, then the next time we have a project to kind of quote on, there's a whole load of stuff that we maybe learned from doing the last proposal. So from my perspective, that cuts the time required from the dev team in terms of contributing to briefs. You know I, I no longer really have to go to them and say. If you want to do this, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, because actually I know because I've already priced it up in previous projects, so it makes it much easier and quicker for me to be able to put proposals together. Why is that important to me? Well, like a lot of um, small businesses, when we started off, we probably had too great a dependency on, um, on a few big clients. And um, the analogy that I always have with that is that it's like kind of hunting for what you know us. So I go out and snare a big deal, drag the marrow back to the coast. <coughs> we feast on it for months. And when we get down to the last leg, so maybe the time like QA starts, we go out, we'll go out and kill another marrow, go out and get another marrow, drag it back to the cage. Same process over and over again. Trouble is with that is that, you know, as time goes on, the marrows become scarcer and scarcer. There's fewer of them about. You've got to find them all. You know, eating mammals is great, you know, really, really rich and sustainable, but you've got to find a, a you've got to find a better way of actually being able to kind of feed yourself. For us that's more about trying to kind of not become hunters for big game, but actually trying to run a farm where we're actually kind of farming, you know, the same kind of products that we can sell over and over again. The thing is though, if you want to run a farm, you need to buy things like tractors and combines. Need to be able to invest in barns to be able to kind of store the equipment and the grain in. And for me, the kind of equipment today is about being able to invest in things like you know Google AdWords to advertise, about social media engagement, you know maybe about kind of doing some uh, cold calling, you know tracking all of your leads in a in a CRM, you know hopefully being able to kind of rely on um, some uh, on some good word of mouth. And maybe at some point, even relying on a sales and marketing team to help generate the <laughs> I feel as a product manager for the last 18 years, I've kind of earned the right to um, refer to sales and marketing teams as clowns, just as having a healthy disrespect for other departments in the same way. But I think those departments have a healthy disrespect for product managers. <laughs> and actually, for us, um, where Drupal is kind of quite great, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a product, but actually it's quite a niche product. You know, it's fairly kind of difficult to find um, decent Drupal developers. So, you know, we feel at the moment that we're offering a service that's in, you know, reasonable demand. Um, and the, uh, you know, the supply is, uh, rather than supply of talent, you know, it doesn't kind of quite meet that demand. So, you know, rather than selling actually kind of cans of baked beans, we're selling, you know, Mongolian vodka or Indian lager or kind of a, Wine from California stuff that's kind of difficult to kind of buy in the UK. And, um, but the staffing and you know, the availability of talent is kind of an important thing because even so, you know, even though it might be difficult to kind of find decent Drupal developers, uh, we sell these services into clients. You know, we want to make sure that, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're giving them a solution that actually they can actually find other people to kind of work on it should they, should they need them to. Significance of the buses is that uh, every day I just imagine my development team getting run over by these, and um, and if I lose somebody all of a sudden, you know, which is always like to happen when you kind of run a business, then you know, what's my business continuity plan in terms of being able to kind of bring somebody else up to speed quickly on a project? You know, I feel I get that more through working with a framework than I would do with a proprietary code. And just to take the farming analogy a little further. Um, 
you know, if we develop <coughs> solutions in um, using open source technology, you know, I don't think we should all be kind of chasing the same sort of clients or the same sorts of projects. You know, I think there's a real opportunity for us to actually start to say, okay, well, you know, we do this kind of stuff in Drupal, but, you know, we're really good at doing this. You know, what we're finding at middle at the moment, now that we've done kind of like nine or ten Drupal projects, we're actually finding that we're starting to get quite a specialism in doing um, uh, really complex site search using um, the Apache Solar project. So we would start to say, actually, that's an area where we, um, where we specialize. But there's uh, another company, another Drupal company in Brighton <coughs> called uh, ICOS. Uh, they specialize on e-commerce solutions built in Drupal. You know, so maybe if we had a project that came in that had a commerce component to it, you know, we might kind of lean on their expertise for doing that, while we might provide the kind of search components. Um, if it was an e-learning thing, you know, they're e-learning kind of Drupal commerce modules, then maybe we might not, not be the best people to actually do that. We can actually go and find the freelancers or the small businesses that are able to kind of supplement um, you know, that solution. So if we go down this kind of farming analogy, you know, we need to start to specialise and you know, maybe just kind of farm, you know, certain crops while we're trying to focus on doing doing everything at once. Um, you know, it'll take a little while to kind of get to that stage, but I think we're a much better place to do that um, by having you know, sensible technology choices around certain types of technology that we use to deliver projects. And that is it. Any questions? <laughs> um, I've got a question. Um, I'm sort of more uh, sort of a Joomla sort of background. So I sort of downloaded Drupal today because I've uh, never used it before. Yeah. I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I could be downloaded and sort of on my laptop and uh, sort of played around with it a bit. Um, well, to me, it's very, very similar to Joomla. So what is it? Uh, Drupal can do, Juma can't. To be honest, I don't really kind of know at the moment what the what the difference is between mm. between the two would be because, like a lot of these things, you know, we start we started using it generally as a result of a client kind of coming to us saying we have this project it needs to be done in Drupal, and that's why we started looking at Drupal. You know, it could have just as easily have been that they requested us to kind of do it in um, in Juma. But I think probably I kind of had this, you know, having looked at Joomla about kind of five years ago and, and discounting at that point for a particular project. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, at the same time, I kind of briefly looked at Drupal. Drupal five or six years ago was a bit of a was a bit of a nightmare. I well, think. yeah, I mean, but they've moved on. Yeah, yeah, it's a massive difference, yeah. And I think that you know, I, I would say probably the kind of two are uh, are much of a muchness really because mm -hmm. you know Joomla has kind of been invented with that whole Lego kit philosophy as well. Yeah. You know, it wasn't Designed to be a you know a truck or a helicopter, so I think the two are probably quite similar. What I would say with Drupal is that I think it has a harder learning curve, mm -hmm. um, and actually for us commercially, I think that's probably why I'm keen to carry on focusing on it because um, you know it's harder to kind of get through that initial learning curve, mm -hmm. and we already have. And actually, I feel commercially that's got more value to us in terms of being able to uh, you know to be able to kind of do certain. Certain projects. Mm. You know, I often find it because we do a lot of WordPress as well. Um, you know, if we get uh, proposals in for WordPress projects, they're much more price sensitive mm. than the Drupal projects are. Mm. Whereas often the Drupal ones are really, you know, the key question isn't how much is it going to cost, it's just about we need the stuff and we need it done by X and can mm. you do it? And if we can say that and then fix a price which, you know, is, is accepted as being market relevant. Get the work on on that basis, um, but yeah, we could have just by chance just that actually easily have ended up mm. sitting here talking about Joomla. But actually, I don't think that's the key thing. I think you know, we did this presentation about two or three months ago, and there was a Ruby on Rails developer, and um, and I think you could apply a lot of this to kind of Ruby on Rails. I think the difference for us with Ruby on Rails would be is that you know. My business hasn't been running long enough for me to be able to hire a lot of the developers I hire pretty much straight out of uni or maybe it's their kind of you know their second job. Um, you know, I believe the has got quite a bit of experience. But um, you know, if I've got fairly green developers, then um, cost effective. 
yeah, yeah, good value. But um, but what they're not so experienced at doing maybe is being able to kind of handle, you know, kind of aggressive client requests. So my concern would be if we were using a framework that actually was more flexible. You know, maybe if we were just coding everything using Symfony or moving on Rails, and a client said, "Can we do this?" You say, well, "Yeah, you can do it, but it will take an extra three months and cost an extra fifteen grand." If um, you know, my developers are experienced enough to be able to kind of manage, you know, pushing clients that well, then actually something like moving on Rails could be a real disaster because we would open ourselves up to, you know, to um, doing stuff that actually cost-wise perhaps we couldn't. Whereas actually, I think a framework that has got limitations, you know, like Vivaldi's kind of group of musicians, that actually gives us more of an opportunity to say, to say no. And I think that's important. What is the uh, what is the going rate then for a Drupal freelancer? Um, I would say if you're working kind of as, as a straight freelancer on your own, decent kind of freelancers going out about 300, 350 a day. Um, from an agency perspective, we'll offer out at about 480 a day if we're managing the projects internally. We'll allow clients to kind of like retain resource on a time and materials basis for about 350. Um, yeah, so it's, it's sort of between sort of 350 and 500 mark, I would say. Right. You talk about um, your own CMS and, and the security mm. issues. With um, open source, do you come across that with WordPress that you get, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, vulnerabilities exposed quicker because it's open source. The other, the other, the other, the other way. Yeah, I think so. The way that I kind of think about that is, is that if if you were going around trying to exploit something, it's fairly easy to kind of spot a Drupal site or a Joomla site or a WordPress site because you're just looking for kind of common patterns in the kind of code or the directory structure, and because there are more sites on it, if you've got something that you want to exploit, you know why. I mean, actually, why would you try and kind of exploit something like Google CMS when there are only 25 sites in the world that use yeah. it? And I think that that was probably the, trip, the trap that some people fall into when they do proprietary solutions. They actually think maybe what they've coded is secure. But the only reason it's secure is because no one's ever trying to kick the front door in. Yeah. You know, it could be one strong boot and it'll just kind of fall over. You know, it could be a real house of cards. Um, and I think that with, yeah, with open source stuff, yeah, it's more open to being exploited. But the benefit of it then being contributed by a community is that when an exploitation is found, the actual door is kind of shut pretty quickly. You know, so security vulnerabilities get shut down, you know, pretty quickly. But what you have to do, there's, you know, if you install something like WordPress or Drupal, you know, don't have usernames and passwords that are, you know, super admin and password, you know, don't necessarily store your login page under you know, WP admin or user, you know, maybe kind of lock it down by IPs. There are a whole load of kind of simple things that you can do to improve the security. Um, but the other key thing, um, and this is one of the things that, you know, we really try and talk to clients about is, uh, you know, we no longer really want to build websites for businesses that just become like a point in time. You know, we're saying, you know, build it, invest in it, engage your audience, you know, look at feature development, do all the stuff that Kate's doing in terms of asking customers what they want, decide how you're going to kind of iterate, iterate features based on the stuff that comes up. You know, and to do that, you need to actually have an ongoing program of development. And part of that is about saying, you know, as new patches and upgrades come, up, come out, make sure you're up to date in terms of installing those, you know, so having a maintenance agreement with your clients that sure. allow you to kind of... Like the re the recast is because we do stuff on open source at Fresh Egg and on bespoke stuff. And that argument, you know, that, that exactly what you just said there works both ways. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's just pay, making people really aware. Yeah. Um, but if you are on WordPress or on open source, that it's absolutely critical you update stuff. Yeah. And yeah. you don't just use every plugin that's available just because it works and it's good, but you, yeah. you, know, you really look into what the vulnerabilities could be and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think actually with Drupal, one of the things that we like maybe with Drupal over WordPress is because all of the modules are essentially open source, mm. if we develop a module for a client, and we did this with the Museum of London where we built a particular module which um, queried some uh, external uh, database of museum objects run by, um, run by Collections Trust, and we said to them, you know, you should let us launch this back into the community. 
and the benefit of launching it back into the community of the process. So well, actually, why would we do that? You know, why would we give away the code that we've spent money on back into the community? And you say, well, you know, why are you a museum? You're not a technology company, so you know you don't really want to be worried about owning IP around code when actually your core business has got nothing to do with code in the first instance. Um, but if you throw it back into the community, other developers will look at it. And other developers will say, you know, the way that you did that like that, actually, if you'd have done it like that it would have been a lot better for working with these kind of things or these kind of things. Um, there's a really big module in Drupal called Views, which allows you to kind of um, theme a lot of the output more effectively, which is a big contributing module in Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. And it's going to be part of the actual core of Drupal 8 when that comes out. Views was actually a module that was built as a result of Sony requesting some, some specific functionality. So to start off with, that was just a custom module used by Sony. In the end, the developers who worked with it to Sony just said, you know, push it back out, you know, let people play with it. And the views module that you've got now is obviously much better than the views module that was built by, you know, three or four developers two or three years ago. And, and I think, you know, going back to my first slide about why CMSs, you know, why, why build another CMS and that we always thought like, you know, the CMSs that are around now are things like Actinic or get the names of a lot of the Microsoft CMS 2002, which was still being used, you know, yeah, or SharePoint or stuff like that. You would expect those things to get better, but actually they don't. The only way I think CMSs get better is when they're contributed to by, by community. And, and for us, that community element is, is just as important as the code. Do you think uh, the, the type of open source license uh, whether it's, you know, it's more community driven or more profit driven? Um, what, so that you're less likely to make money out of it? In well, I'm just saying, if you, it's the, the GPL license means that you, you, you can't uh, yeah, mod modify uh, some, some module and, uh, and, and, and then yeah, and sell your modified version. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, you can. So I think you can kind of you can you, you, you can sell on your solution in terms of time and effort, mm -hmm. but you can't claim ownership of it, can you? Yeah. Um, but I think I think for us, we would never want to kind of claim ownership of something anyway. And, and actually, I mean that would be the that would be the argument is sort of like why you know why do you need to actually kind of own this? I mean, if you think of the difference between something that is open source license and then something that is proprietary license. The actual only only difference is in the fact that you pay for that license, and then you know how the how the license is actually is actually written. Um, you know, I think that's why it's the freedom bit rather than the it doesn't cost as much is the important kind of criteria. Because um, you know, if you're going to build a CMS and an open source solution, even for a really big organisation, you know, the the, the 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 difference in terms of licensing cost is probably not going to be key criteria in terms of whether you should go with one, one thing or another, or, or at least I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that some of the bigger businesses that we've done Drupal development for have chosen Drupal just because it's going to save them, you know, X thousand pounds in a few.